from there. All right. <clears throat> Who loves horses? Who's got a horse? Who? You've got a horse. You've got two horses. Right. Somebody's going to be a preacher, isn't they? <laughs> well, you know, I had a horse when I was a boy. And that's a long time ago. <coughs> it was given to me, and it had a funny name. This horse had a funny name. I could never understand why it had such a name. Its name was Pingalore. Now, fancy having a horse like Pingalore. It was a little stallion horse. It was what we called a scrub pony. Now, a scrub pony... Is not a very big horse, but he's very, very fast and very nimble horse. Now, I was just thinking if I had another horse, if I had a big horse, I might call him, oh, what would you say, Lomo? Do you know Lomo? He's a football player. He's a big man, Lomo is. Then if I didn't have a horse so big, I think I might call him Daniel Carter. Hey, hey. Yes. Yes. And then if I had a tall horse, I think I might call him Luke. You know Luke Melville? He's a tall boy. So I think I might call him Luke. Okay. But I want to show you a picture on the screen. There you are. Can you see that there? Now, who do you think is the boy in the little nappy? All right, you grown-ups can work it out. Who's the boy in the nappy? Who? You, were, you must have known before. <laughs> yes, that's David. See, that's David. He's looking at that horse. See, would you do a thing like that when you're a little like that? Well, you know what? He wasn't supposed to be there for a starter, right? He was there. And that horse was not a very good horse. He wasn't a very pleasant horse and, the, and I remember when he got in the paddock the man said don't move too suddenly because he said that horse is a nasty horse but you know what animals do animals know children don't they they know children are not going to give them any do them any harm and so there you are see there's that horse he's just looking at David and I think David eventually put his hand up and touched his nose right? so this horse of mine whose name was Pingalore he, when I first got him, he was a very no nervous horse. You know what I mean about nervous? He was, well, he was very fidgety. He, would, he wasn't very easy to handle. And every time I went to put the bridle on him, he'd throw up his head. Because you know why? Because the people who had him before him used to hit him on the head when he didn't do anything properly. Right? And you know it took me months and months and months to treat that horse so that eventually that horse would let me put the bridle on, it would not, not throw its head over. You see, animals know when you're unkind to them. It's like people. I mean, you know when somebody's not kind to you, don't you? You know? And so animals are the same. And God made animals for you and I to have joy and pleasure with. And so when you have an animal, you look after that animal and look after it, be kind to you. And then that horse, in the end, would follow me around, would put his head under my arm for me to give him a little tickle on the nose. It was a different horse. And I used to ride that horse many, many miles. I used to muster horses. You know what mustering horses are? You bring other horses in, wild horses in. And that little horse was very sure-footed. He never fell over. He never tripped. And he was a great horse. His name was Pingalore, of all the names but be kind to your animals. If you've got a cat, who's got a cat? Oh, you've all got a cat. What about a dog? Who's got a dog? So you, you've got a goat, have you? Yeah. Is he a good goat? Well, we can't hear him, so, so I can't touch the I don't think if we, if we keep you here any longer, we'll get all the family secrets from you. <laughs> so remember that be kind to animals and they'll be good back to you. All right? Yes. Okay. Back to your seats.
Good morning, church. It's now time for a prayer, so I invite you to kneel if you're able as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we kneel before you this morning and remember you as our great God, especially this Sabbath as we participate in communion. I pray that you come and be with us, be with Gary as he leads out, and um, be close to us and, and help us to remember what great sacrifice you paid for us, all because you loved us. I pray for the people that couldn't be here today, you know what reasons have kept them away, please be with them and give them a special Sabbath day's blessing. I'm also reminded to, to thank you for the special talents that you um, bless us with after hearing the item this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, draw close to us. Um, remind us of the ways that we push you away. Convict us of our sins and um, help us to, to pray for the forgiveness of those sins. Please be with us this week. Um, guide us and lead us. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord again on his Sabbath day? And uh, Mary and I feel like we're the traveling ministers because we seem to be going all over the place, but it's great to be home again on this Sabbath day. And today we have a lot of reasons to thank the Lord. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Well, we do. We do. Because this week was a very, very hard week for Mary and I. We got information that her mother wasn't well and of course we've just been visiting her and um, everything seemed to be going okay but we don't know what's just around the corner do we and unfortunately she got a, a urinal infection which had then moved up into her kidneys she was trying to look after it herself one doctor she saw gave her uh, antibiotics which didn't uh, look after the particular illness that she had and unfortunately it got into her bloodstream to the extent that she got blood poisoning and, uh, and, of course, when you're so far away, uh, it is quite hard to deal with things like that. So the call we got was, yeah, mum's in hospital again. And um, you know, Marion's mum, as you know, is 81. And uh, we never know whether it's going to be the last time, whether we're going to see them when we're on our holidays. And it was by the grace of God, only by the grace of God, that they were able to save her by two hours. Only by two hours. They said, if you'd come two hours later, we wouldn't have been able to reverse the blood poisoning so we give our lord um, praise this morning and thanks for looking after mum and it's it's absolutely beautiful because of the knowledge the technology that, that we have today that we can ring her in a hospital on the other side of the world and pray to the lord to ask for healing and he's done that this morning uh, he's done that this week so again we just thank uh, those who knew of it who did pray but most of all our lord and savior that she's She's well, she's mending well, and she wants to stay in hospital so that when she comes out before next Sabbath, she can witness a young lady she's brought to Christ in baptism. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's one little testimony I'd just like to give the Lord praise for this morning. But at our quarter past five prayer meeting here on Wednesday, all of us were challenged as we studied about the Holy Spirit. We were challenged to to pray to the Lord that if there was someone on Wednesday that he brought into our lives, uh, especially that we would tell them about this wonderful plan of salvation, about the joy that's in our heart, about our love for Jesus Christ, you know. And Bill came up with the idea that even if a name comes into our mind or into our memory, ring that person. So as I'm traveling up to Kaikoe on Wednesday, I'm thinking, well, this also applies to me. And I was given a name um, from a man that, uh, who lives in, in the mid-north. So as I arrived in Kaikoui, because you're not allowed to phone and drive, I 
and I, and I was asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, you've got to give me the words to say to this man because I, I don't know where he's at in his walk with you. As far as I knew, they were once um, fellowshipping in the Adventist church. So I rang him, and he says, oh, thanks for ringing. Uh, can you ring me in half an hour? I said, okay, I'll do that. So while that half an hour elapsed, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will continue to give me the words to talk to this man. So anyway, half an hour came by, and I dialed the number again, and he said... Um, said, uh, hello, it's Simon here. I said, hi, Simon, it's Pastor Gary. And I said, uh, I believe you, uh, you uh, fellowship with the Adventist, in the Adventist faith or you're from the Adventist faith. And he said, he said, wow. He said, I've never had a pastor ring me before. He says, you've made my day. He says, will you come and see us? And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, uh, next week. How's next week? He said, no, that's good. But, you know, again, just from that little prayer meeting and that request that if someone the Lord brought someone into your mind just to go and ring them and let them know that God loves them, right? And of course, he said, okay, I'm going to have my wife next week and, uh, and my friend who's given you the number to be there also. So it's just amazing how we can, how we can serve our Lord and Saviour by bringing happiness to someone. And I'd like to put that challenge out to you this week that if you think of anybody that you haven't seen for a long time or that the Lord's impressed you to ring, give them a ring and uh, yeah i've just got a note too and uh, uh, a little note that i forgot to mention you all know uh, alice and tony uh, the chinese couple that are worshiping with us well she had a little baby girl on thursday and when i saw tony it was as if he'd had the baby because he said that was hard work <laughs> but um <laughs> so uh praise the lord again too that they had a nice uh, healthy little little girl let's just pray before we go into the word of god Dear Heavenly Father, we again just thank you that we can be here as a family this morning to worship you, Lord, and to uh, receive your word. Father, we know that we've failed you, especially as we come closer to you, Lord. We realize that, that we are sinful and that we are certainly in, deed or in need of your, of your forgiveness. So, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness and thank you for your spirit, Lord. May you be with us today as we uh, go through our service and our communion service too. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, it's very familiar to us as, uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, but if you could just turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and I'll be reading um, from verse 4 down to about um, 9. Matthew, chapter 24, reading from verse 4 and reading down to chapter 10. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. We know what's taken place just before this. They've, they've uh, spoken to Jesus, his disciples, and said, Tell us of what's going to happen before, you, before the second coming. So Jesus sits them down and he's telling them uh, in that opening verse and says, Take heed that no man deceive you. A powerful little verse just uh, parked in there, isn't it? That no one that no man will deceive you. And of course, we know who the ultimate deceiver is. That is uh, Satan, the devil. And he tries to deceive us in every aspect of our life. Every moment of our lives, he's trying to take us away from Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, uh, he, uh, he sometimes succeeds, but only sometimes because Jesus again has won the victory. Then it comes on to say, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Just in those two sentences, those two verses, we have that word deceived uh, mentioned twice uh, again. But he says that many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And it is amazing that even in that little island off the, off the coast, off our west coast there of Australia, there's a man roaming around saying that he's Jesus Christ. And, and, and the most sad part about it is he's got followers. Um, you know, but here again is prophecy fulfilled uh, right next door in a country that uh, that's uh, where a lot of our families live, and to think that it also could happen here in New Zealand. But of course, many people are deceived, have been deceived by other um, other religions that aren't preaching the true gospel as we know it. Uh, people who are getting tied up in religions from occult and, and uh, Asian Eastern mystic religions totally been deceived but the main point of my this particular verse that i want to mention this morning and it says and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars 
See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Amazing, isn't it? The thing about this, when Jesus said this and he quoted to his disciples, it was just on 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago. So when he said it that in the last days, in the last days commenced when Jesus went to heaven, right? And he said that uh, there will be wars, rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Well, if the end was then, not yet, then how close are we are to the end 2,000 years uh, later? 2,000 years later from when Jesus quoted that. And it was interesting to note that when we were in Switzerland, I, um, I we were staying at Mary Young, Marianne's younger sister's place. We turned on the news, and they had a special uh, um, a broadcast on the amount of wars that are actually taking place in Europe or around the world at the moment. And there were 10 registered um, sites or countries that were actually at war with one another. Amazing when you think that we're in the 21st century and people are still fighting each other. As mentioned on the television, the war at that time was in, in Ukraine, extending to the Middle East, Israel, Syria, Palestine, and of course, northern Iraq from Pakistan across to Libya and other parts of Africa. And these were the main 10 wars taking place at the moment on our planet. Underneath that, there's a lot of skirmishes uh, between civil unrest in a lot of ca uh, minor countries uh, mentioned in, um, in Africa. So isn't that sad to think that in this day, the 21st century, that people are still fighting each other and of course when we think of the war that is currently going on in uh, between Syria and Iraq it is really really devastating but when we hear such atrocities that are taking place how do we react have we come become numb to those atrocities that are taking place or do we then get on our knees and start praying as uh, as you've seen some email emails going through uh, going around requesting that we pray for these dear Christians in these countries where the ISIS are going systematically through the villages and killing the Christians. Amazing, isn't it? But Jesus said it would happen. There'll be wars, nations against nation, and, uh, and of course, rumors of wars. But it's happening. And to think that those young children are being killed because they are not giving up their faith in Jesus Christ. They're not being forced con to convert to Islam. They are claiming still the name of Jesus Christ and are being martyred for that. When I, when I read that email, I thought, how sad is that? And I thought, well, how, how would it be with us if somebody knocked on our door and said, would you give up on the name of Jesus Christ and convert to Islam? Otherwise, you be, would be killed. What a great test that would be for our faith in Jesus Christ. And I hope that none of you would, uh, would deny your, save, your Savior, Jesus Christ. But isn't it sobering to know how close that is? And Jesus said it 2,000 years ago, and it's unfolding in countries around the world uh, today. And even, as you know, there was an incident in, um, in Australia this week. But, you know, when we think of wars, it is not about the games that we play on Xbox, or the computers. It's about lives that are prematurely wasted, prematurely brought to an end. Lives are suddenly destroyed, cease to exist overnight or in a, in, a, in, a, in a breath or in a very short moment. And of course, it's not only these lives that cease to exist, but history is being changed. History has been changed in the life of the country, uh, yeah, lives of those people who live in that country, but also amongst their families and their friends. The history of families are wiped out, annihilated, because of the, the insidious, uh, insidious actions 
of these people. People's lives that God created and breathed into them the very breath of life, only to be wasted at a young age and, uh, and in the prime of their life in most cases. Or even as couples enjoying the twilight years of their lives after sacrificing time, finances and their health for the benefit of educating their children and in such a, an instant, dreams are shattered. It's happening on the other side of the world, but what would we be, how would we be reacting if it was happening here in our own country? Then, of course, there are those whose lives are not taken, but a life of misery then commences as they have to cope with lifelong injuries and memories of atrocities that have play, been played out in their family members or amongst their family members or even amongst the people in the villages that they live in. It's a sad world, isn't it? But these things are taking place. And of course, war doesn't have a pleasant face. In spite of whoever wins, war never has a pleasant face. The face of war is marred by untold memories. And you know, I have a chap I was been working with on Monday, and he's fought, he's only, say, in his 40s, 45, and he's fought in the Bosnian War and in another war, and uh, some of the stories he told me were just absolutely amazing. The only positive thing that came out of that is that as he, as he relayed some of the jobs he did also for relief agencies, I was able to tell him about the wonderful work ADRA does around the world. And he said, can you give me that uh, web page so I can have a look at it too? Um, so we always have that opportunity to have a positive uh, input into what people are saying. And of course, there are many different reasons why wars um, develop. However, primarily they seem to stem by a group or a person wanting to enforce their power, their ideal upon others for personal gain, acknowledgement or entitlement. Wars, though, come with a huge price, a price that is not one that we can pay necessarily ourselves. War comes with a price and it is a cost that they, the instigators, cannot pay themselves. War defined in the dictionary, in the um, uh, Oxford Dictionary says, war is a state of armed conflict between different nations or states or different groups within a nation or state. A state of competition, conflict or hostility between different people or groups. And it's still happening in the 21st century. Jesus prophesied it and of course it will go right through to the very end. Unfortunately, too, we are also soldiers in a war. And that war was a war that was instigated in the realms of heaven, a war that we call the Great Controversy. A war that was instigated by the pride of a created being, a war that started um, in the presence of God himself. A being whose pride and jealousy of Christ was allowed within himself to nourish the, de the desire of supremacy. A being whose pride and jealousy of Christ was allowed within himself to nourish the desire of supremacy. Lucifer, Lucifer glorified in his brightness and exaltation and he misinterpreted the willingness of the other angels to fill his commands he misunderstood that as worship. Hence, he, Lucifer, then seeks to recruit his followers amongst the angelic host and refute the holy law of God. The holy law of God, a law of love, he challenged and opposed. Lucifer went from light bearer to deceiver. He actually moved out of the presence of God to start his work of deceiving the other uh, members of the angelic host. His sin of discontentment had to, had to mature within the heavenly realm in order for the others to see its true demise. 
And if we just look in the book of uh, Ezekiel, chapter 28, verse 12 and 15, it just gives us this confirmation that this war, uh, that this uh, yeah, war did start in heaven through, through the sin of Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 to 15. And it says, But there was one that chose to pervert this freedom, the freedom that God had given every uh, one within the heavenly realm. Sin originated with him who next to Christ had been most honored of God and who stood highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Before his fall, Lucifer was first of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. Thus said the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Amazing, isn't it? That even such a, such a, a, a thing could happen in the presence of God. But because the, Satan had the freedom and he was the most beautiful covering cherub, pride took over his countenance and caused him to fall. Not only something that would happen to Lucifer, but it can happen to us on a daily basis when we also um, let pride uh, reign in our lives. And of course then there was no place then found uh, in heaven for Lucifer. As when we read that in, uh, in the book of, uh, Reve- um, sorry, yeah, book of Revelation chapter 12, <clears throat> reading from um, verse 7. We have that other, other confirmation, and it says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So now the war that originated in heaven after all accusations against God's law are hurled is now to be combated out upon planet earth. Again, the war that's named the great controversy has now been played out upon the battlefield of planet earth and the whole universe is watching. The whole universe is watching. Unfortunately, the trophy or the trophies of the great controversy isn't about winning back territory or claiming back borders. The trophies are you and I. The question is in your hands, are you going to lose on Satan's side or win with Jesus who has already won the battle? Are we going to sin with Satan or win with Jesus? Sin resulted in heaven through Satan's rebellion. Are we also to continue in rebellion of God's word? The only definition of sin is that given in the word of God, it is the transgression of the law. It is the outworking of the principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. I'll read that again. Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God, It is the transgression of the law. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Quotation from Great Controversy, page 492. The thing is that this war, this war that is taking place, is fast coming to an end, and the victory song is about to be played once again. The victory song is about to be played once again. It was played when Jesus went to heaven, I'm sure, that when he was welcomed home by the angels. And of course, when we comes to take us home, again, that victory song will be played. Have you already answered your question as to whom you are going to serve? 
Paul tells us, or teaches us, to defend ourselves as we look up in the book of Ephesians. He tells us how to defend ourselves. And reading from the book of Ephesians... From chapter 6, uh, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on, not part of the armor, but put on the whole armor of God so that you too will be able to stand against the, the evil wiles of the devil. For verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. The time is precious and the devil knows that his time is short. He is going around like a roaring lion and, um, and he's trying to take as many people down as he can. I just had an instant yesterday or this week too where one of my, the elders in the Kaikoui church mentioned how his niece had fallen back into drug taking, into um, pee taking. And, uh, you know, she's trying so hard, but of course it's very prevalent drug taking in Kaikoui. So I texted her last evening just to tell her that Jesus loves her and that she too should come back into church fellowship. I said to her, why don't you just text your uncle and ask him to pick you up and take you to church? And the answer came back and says, thank you, Pastor. She says, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And she did. And uh, so we just pray that she's in uh, church fellowship this morning because the devil is trying to take as many as he can. And when you think of the wars that are taking place in different countries, He's able to wipe out so many people who have non, not yet given their lives to Jesus Christ. He's a coward. So stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, having our loins girt with the, with the truth of the gospel, that wherever we go, we take the truth with us. But what I love about this breastplate of righteousness, you know, the breastplate protects our, our breast our, where our heart is. And of course, Jesus is the one who loves us so much that he is our righteousness and he protects us. Have your, in verse 15, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. As you shoe a horse with, uh, with metal shoes to last, we too should be shod with the, with the gospel of peace, that too, wherever we go, we bring this beautiful gospel of peace to those who we come in contact with. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of of faith taking the shield of faith you know in the old days when they went into war with those shields they normally had the inscription of who they were fighting for upon that shield and ours should be emblazoned with the faith that we have in jesus christ wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked when we have that faith we have the faith and the strength to overcome verse 17 and take heed the helmet take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Interesting that it says to take the helmet of salvation. We have to protect our head uh, because our head is the computer of our, uh, our bodies. But it's amazing, though, that in our head, that have to, what has to be protected are all our senses, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our taste, and it's often, or mainly too, in a lot of cases, that these senses cause us to sin from what we see, what we hear, what we taste, and, uh, and things that we smell cause us to sin. So the Lord, who is um, the head of the body, he is our salvation, says that we should protect ourselves with the helmet of salvation. And the spirit, and the sword of the spirit, we know that the, the sword of the spirit is a sharp two-edged sword and it cuts to the bone. But it tells us too that, uh, sorry, the, which is the word of God, the word of God directs us and puts us on the right path. Without the word of God, we're lost. The word of God is Jesus Christ and it gives us guidance for our lives. It is our, our um, it is our, um, what should I say, our manual for life. 
But of course, here comes the favourite one of us all, I hope. In verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Prayer. We just cannot have enough of prayer. And as I said to a saint this morning, our time that we spend on our knees is getting longer and longer as there's more people who need our prayers and in, that we should supplicate before our Lord, that we should intercede before our Lord. 1 Timothy in 6.12, it says too that we should fight the good fight, fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. We need to be spending more time in the study of God's word so that our faith is increased so that we too, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will overcome whatever the devil throws at us. We need the Holy Spirit. But also let us not fall into the category of those mentioned in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. So if you could just turn there too. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continues as they were from the beginning of creation. Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to fall into that category. As we said in the Sabbath school, we know that Jesus came on time the first time and he's coming on time the second time. These things that he said will happen are happening in Matthew 24. They are the, the indicators, the signpost on the road to eternal life that these things are going to take place and they're happening around us what the disciples thought was going to happen in their lifetime is happening in our lifetime jesus is coming soon amen so please don't fall into the category of the scoffers and of course we've come today to also celebrate that victory that was won that was played out on calvary jesus gave his life in order that we can have eternal life. He fought a great fight and he has won. I'd like us to, um, just to now contemplate our time that um, we, we need for our communion service and I'll just turn to the, to the reference that I need there. In the book of John. John chapter 13. John chapter 13, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Verse 4, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewithin he was girded. Then cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do now knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not, only, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. 
So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So today we're going to practice that example that Jesus has given us. We too are going to wash one another's feet. The ladies uh, will wash the, their sisters' feet and the men their brothers' feet out in the hall. And, um, you know, Jesus says, unless we participate of this washing, we cannot have a part of him. So uh, let us just bow before we go out. And as we go out into the hall to, uh, or into the uh, conference room, remember it's not a social gathering. Be reverent in what you're doing and pray with your brother or sister uh, that you're, uh, of whom you're washing each other's feet. So please just bow your head as we uh, uh, pray. Father, it is, um, it is with joy again that we come before you, before your throne in prayer this morning, Lord, to say thank you for everything that you've done in our lives, that you have answered prayer, Lord, not necessarily at the, at the time we've expected, but as the time has elapsed, Lord, you have answered prayers, and for this we give you thanks and praise. Lord, as the wars around the world take place, we're just so thankful, Lord, that Jesus has won the war, that he's, he's won the victory, Lord, and that he's by our side every step of the way. Help us never to fear, Lord, but to fight the good faith and have the faith that we need to overcome. Lord, as we go to washing others, one another's feet this morning, help us to forgive those who have failed us, who have um, gone against us, Lord, or gone, gone against you, Lord. Help us to forgive these people as you forgive us, Lord. And may your spirit anoint our minds and renew our minds, Lord, for the, um, for the week that's ahead of us. And we ask you this in Jesus' loving and kind name. Amen. Jesus uh, said to his disciples in John 6, verse 34, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I'm just going to ask uh, Brother Lou to pray on the bread. If we could all kneel, please. Father in heaven, this morning, we just want to thank you again, Lord, that we can be here in your house of worship on this special occasion. Father, we just reflect back on the upper room and the example that you set. And Lord, that we have this opportunity of repeating what you did at that time. Lord, we just ask again for your forgiveness, ask for your guidance and your blessing. And we ask, Lord, that as we go out from here, we will share your love that you shared with us. Lord, we pray that you will bless this bread and it, as, it, uh, as an emblem of your bro broken body on Calvary. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. You know, this, uh, <clears throat> this week also I had to um, go to a doctor to get the results of a blood test. And I, as I was um, hearing from the doctor the results of this blood test, I was amazed. They can see through your blood if there's anything wrong with your liver, your heart, or any other part of your body. And she said, when you gave your blood, there must have been a little cold just uh, sneaking around somewhere because your platelets are quite high uh, when, when we did that. But nothing to worry about. And I thought, you know, when if Jesus had given his blood just prior to his death, I wonder what, how high his platelets would have been and what would that have indicated? Would that have indicated that he was slowly dying of a broken heart for you and for me? And as we know, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So now I'd like to ask John to pray over the blood, over the wine. Mm. Father in heaven, we kneel because uh, you alone are worthy of praise and we marvel that you would become human so that you could die for us. And as we contemplate again your blood shed for us, Lord, may partaking in uh, this symbol change our lives uh, into the image of your life. We want to um, be the people you intended and we know that the only way that can happen is if uh, you live in us. So please, each person here today, may we dedicate our lives to you. May you fill us so that we will overflow to blessings, with blessings to people around us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do you as oft you drink it in remembrance of me. Special thanks to uh, everyone who has served the church today for this communion service. And as we leave uh, today, we'd like to stand and praise the Lord and thank him with singing, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary.
Three times Jesus says, remember to keep holy my Sabbath day. When you do this, do this in remembrance of me with his body and his blood. May we not go away here, never, never to forget how big and gracious our Lord Jesus Christ is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you that burdens are lifted at Calvary. Thank you for paying again the huge price that we remember today in this service. Lord, as we leave each other's company, may your spirit go with us. May your spirit anoint our lips, our minds, and, and our feet, Lord. Bring us to those who are, who are suffering, depressed, who don't know you, Lord. Help us to encourage them and strengthen them, Lord. But most of all, again, count us worthy for when that day comes. So, Lord, we just pray that you'll bless us in a special way uh, throughout this week. In Jesus' loving name, amen.